So today I'm going over titles that we've actually covered in this class so far. And I'll be typing them up here in a list in just a second. But the main point here is to look and see what similarities are existing between the stories. So if you remember way back, we actually read uh, titles we had read, type it now. We actually read the story of Little Riding Hood. And we read the story of Goldilocks and Three Bears. And I'll put links to all these. We read the story of the Three Billy Goats Gruff. Gruff. We read the story of the Three Little Pigs. We read the story of Puss in Boots. What else? Young Goodman Brown, we are currently in that. And I also want to look at Bobby Yaga and Vasilisa. All these are at the, or all the Young Goodman Brown, they're all available online. One way or the other. I'm going to. I'm going to find the story. Oh, yeah, and Hansel Battle. We did that too, didn't we? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Puss in Boots. There's a great site of American literature where they have all these Snow White, and Snow White, Seven Dwarves. So, Ansel and no white seven dwarves. And one of the things about this is that there's a, a theory or an idea in literary criticism that says there are repeating patterns and things. Uh, repeat over and over again, or images of the over and over again. And so you can take different stories and look at them and say, well, how does this story relate to that story? How does the image of, say, boots show up in different stories? And is that significant? If our stories represent something, and if we convey ideas through the images of stories, then it's worth looking into and see how are these stories all related? Certainly, it's important to get stories in your head to create what William Butler Yeats called a phantasmagoria, which is the bulk of imagery. In your head. But it's also important to look and see what, what do these images represent and how are they used in different stories, one to the next. So, with that in mind, I wanted to consider there's a major image that these you know, shows up over and over. Which is the image of the forest or the image of the woods. And you'll notice in Young Goodman Brown that he's going into the woods. So, what does that entail? What does that mean? Um, why is he going into the woods? What does the woods represent? If you go back even to the first story, the, the Red Riding Hood, remember she goes into the woods. Why? Remember, I talked about natural and conventional symbolism, how conventional symbolism is agreed upon by a society and bound to the culture. So in order to understand it, you have to understand the culture to a certain degree because conventional symbolism doesn't always outlast the culture. Sometimes it's lost over time or it means something to one culture and a different thing to another culture. Natural symbolism, on the other hand, is embedded in the actual uh, nature of the thing. And by nature, I don't mean the 
trees and woods and flowers and birds flying by. That's not what I mean. I mean nature in the way that Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, talked about nature, which is the essence of the thing. And the essence of the thing in its various qualities. So like there's an essence of a tree, bark, leaves, xylem, the flow, photosynthesis, the way it waves in the wind, the way it can't move and it's walk around. Those are all part of the tree ness, different from flower ness or brick ness, the brick or bird ness or dog ness. So when you want to use a symbol to represent something, you think about its natural qualities. What does it have naturally that loans itself to talking about some idea? As an example, there's some phrases like thick as a brick, it means you're stupid. You know, if you're thick as a brick, it means your head is brick-like. Right? Your soul is brick-like. Well, what does that mean? What are the natural qualities of a brick that lend it to being representation of being stupid? Um, it's made out of clay, which is one of the basis materials. It's heavy. It's coarse. Not a lot gets through a brick. <laughs> it's not like uh, linen. It's not a mist. Bricks are solid and very plain, not elegant at all. So really the, the whole nature of brickness lends itself to that phrase, thick as a brick. Or you might say, she's an angel. She's an angel. Sweet and honey from the tree. She's an angel. It's a song of kids. You can look it up. Well, a woman, which the song is about, a woman is not an angel. So why use that? Say, she's an angel. Because we associate certain qualities with angels. Angels are above this world and beautiful and terrible. They are bright, shiny, lovely. They float around, elegant. They are the height of power and grace and elegance. So if you wanted to compliment your girl, you wouldn't say, hey, you're a brick. Because they might mean, hey, you're stupid, which is not a compliment. You might say, hey, you're an angel which is a compliment. The natural symbolism associated with angels makes that analogy appropriate. So in both bricks and angels, there are natural qualities that we use in order to represent something, an idea. We might say, he's a tiger on the field. Meaning that on the field, when playing football or soccer or basketball or whatever, he's ferocious and powerful and fast. Or you might say, I wandered lonely as a cloud. Like a, when you're lonely, like a cloud floating around. Or you might say, she wore a red hood because red has certain natural qualities. The point being that natural symbolism is already embedded in the image. And the image resonates with us as human beings, regardless of our time period or culture. It just resonates with us because we're human. There's never been a human who hasn't experienced trees, for instance, or sand or the color red. So when we do that, natural symbols and conventional symbols, we embed those natural symbols or conventional symbols in stories. 
and to understand the stories, we look and see well, what do the images or symbols mean. And one of the things we do is we look at how different authors use that same symbol in their story. Are they using it the same way? Are they using it differently? What in that symbol loans itself to something in the story? Can we understand the story better by looking at the symbol? So we use symbols either as, well, the most common way to use symbols is what's called analogy, analog. Analogy is where one thing represents another thing. So again, Red Riding Hood. The red hood that she wears is an analogy for something else. It's an analogy to something else. In the story, she's literally wearing a red hood. That's the literal of it. But then you have the next level up, which is the allegorical level. And that's where we look and see well, how else is red used in other stories, other cultures, in nature. And the author is making an analogy. This is compared to that. This represents that. So it's not accidental. He's not just saying little... I don't know, whatever, red, but <laughs> it's, it's intentionally, intentionally chooses red, but if she were little puce, but or little fuchsia, but a little mauve, but it'd be a very different story. Chartreuse, ferret, little black, but little gray, but it'd be a very different story. There are two major ways that we use analogy. One is simile, the other is metaphor. When we use simile, we say this is similar to that. This is like that. So you are as thick as a brick. I wandered lonely like a cloud. He's acting like a tiger. Those are similes. Metaphor, on the other hand, is a direct comparison. So like when you say he is a tiger, he is a brick, that idea is gold. It's metaphor, direct comparison. Whereas the others separated by the words like or as or somewhat. The use of imagery in stories is, especially fairy tales, is normally metaphor. So we don't say little like red riding hood. We say little red riding or hood is red. It isn't like red. It is red, it's a metaphor. And then when we pick it apart, we say, okay, well, if she's got a red riding hood, how else is that used in other stories? We look at other stories and say, well, let's use this way, this way, this way, this way. Probably it's used this way in this story too. And then we compare that to what do we know about red and Riding hoods, just from nature, because that's important too. So, for instance, red is used for stop signs, and it's been used to represent courage, and has been used to represent youth, and has been used to represent love. Red is the blanket waved in front of the bull. Red is the color of wine. 
red is the color of blood. And all those things at the same time are packed into that image. It's easier to say red than it is to say all those different images because it takes too long. And then what do we know about the wearing of the hood? Well, it covers the head, obviously. It's not little red riding boots. Though the image of boots nose comes up later in the story of uh, Puss in Boots. Why does why is it not Puss in Gloves or Puss in Hat? No, it's Puss in Boots. It could have been uh, Puss in Cake or uh, Puss in Weskin. But the boots are simply just as here in the story of literate riding hood, the riding hood is important. I've always wondered why riding hood? What's up with that? How is that different from just little red hood? Why covering of the head? Well, we know, for instance, before Vatican II, women covered their head when they went into church. Why? You cover your head when you're cold. You cover your head when you don't want to be recognized. You're hidden. So we have to just ponder that. Why why riding? Why that? Girls seem to always love horses. Maybe that's what it is. Horses. Spirit. So when we look at these different stories, look at how a single image plays through all of them. So for instance, take this image of the forest, okay? If we go through the story, Little Riding Hood, she goes into the forest and that's where not only does grandmother live in the middle of the forest, but she also meets the big bad wolf. Okay, so is that. Notice that in Goldilocks and the Three Bears, Goldilocks goes, into the forest, and there in the middle of the forest, she finds three bears. Notice also that uh, three little pigs, they build their houses out of forest materials. Hansel and Gretel get abandoned in the forest. Snow White escapes from an evil queen in the forest where she meets seven dwarves in the middle of the forest. Hansel and Gretel meet the horrible ogreish witch in the forest. When we read Babi Yaga and Vasilisa, you'll find that uh, Babi Yaga, who is the witch of the story, lives in the forest. And then young Goodman Brown goes into the forest. So culturally speaking, our concept of forest right now is like something to be enjoyed or something to be conquered or uh, a weekend trip away from the city. And we get a lot of that from the 19th century, the romantic movement, which is sort of like get away from these dark satanic mills and go out in the countryside and enjoy the air and the openness and nature. Before that movement, the romantic movement of the early part of the 19th century, the forest was seen as something dangerous, something wild, something in which dark things lurk. I mean, you look at uh, Dante Alighieri, who starts his great trilogy. He says, in the middle of this life, I woke in the dark forest to find the right path to live, lost and gone. So he starts in a dark forest or a dark wood. You've got tail after tail, the woods or forest being dangerous, not something to go into. Um, Shakespeare has images of the forest as being dangerous, but also places of refuge from the politics of the city. So when we get to these 
stories of the forest and the fairy tales, they are playing off a cultural tradition the forest sees as hostile or dangerous. But we also have to consider the nature of what that means, because in Europe, especially for these forests were vast forests. They, they covered huge swaths of land and miles and miles of trees unbroken, maybe a house here or there. And even in America, especially on the East Coast, you had these gigantic forests, something we can hardly conceive of now. But it used to be said that a squirrel could jump from tree to tree and travel from New York to Indiana without touching the ground. That's how vast the forests were in America originally. Cut down now. England used to be covered in a forest back before the uh, 1300s, 1400s, when massive consumption of wood uh, was used in order to try and fend off the little ice age where all of Europe was kind of freezing. So the forest was this very large, dense, scary place. And people that lived on the edge of the forest frequently would have creatures coming out of the forest they didn't expect. So not just cute deer and bunny mammoths and squirrels, but also bear, which is pretty terrifying. Wolves, which is terrifying. Large cats, because lions used to live in Europe up until, oh, I don't know, about the 200s AD, when they were hunted to extinction. But you had all sorts of animals that come out of the forest. You never knew what was there. And so in some ways, the forest was kind of like the ocean. It was dark and deep and filled with scary things. You know, I just read a story about a creature that they found in the deep ocean. It's totally black, almost invisible in the darkness of the ocean. It has gigantic teeth and glowing eyes. It looks like a giant dragon. And they hold one up on a Japanese trawler, and it is something out of nightmare. And there are other creatures down in the de depths, squid, giant squid, um, glowing fish, things with nasty, sharp, pointy teeth. That it makes you wonder what else is down there. If you were to drain the ocean, what kind of critters would you find? And how many would want to just bite off your leg and chew on it like a chicken bone? Same thing with the forest. The forest used to be a place of great terror and you didn't go there in order to just camp out. Camping out was a dangerous business because you never knew when a grizzly was gonna wander into your camp. So it's wild and untamed, dense, dark. This is why in The Hobbit, when they go through Mirkwood, Terrifying thing. But because of that, because of that natural imagery and the cultural imagery that flowed from it, forest ends up representing uh, what? The darkness of the soul, darkness of the heart, darkness of the unknown. So if it represents the darkness of the heart, like the human heart. All these stories of journeying into the forest are like self-examination. It's like an examination of conscience. What kind of person am I? Who am I? What am I destined for? What am I capable of, both good and bad? And the journey into the forest is like a, an adventure. It's like going into a maze to defeat a monster. Like in Greece, you have the story of uh, the Minotaur in the middle of the labyrinth. He was defeated by Theseus, I think. Well, the, the maze, the labyrinth, is a forest. We frequently see a forest described as labyrinthine. There are labyrinths. And you go in there and you slay the monster. Poof to poof, you get uh, a, a weapon or an idea or a power of some kind or a gift, a boon. But you have to defeat that monster or ogre or witch or whatever it is at the center of the forest first. So you could say, okay, in Little Red Riding Hood, the forest is described this way. 
And in Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the forest is described this way. And in Hansel and Gretel, the forest is described this way. Snow White and Seven Doors, Young Goodman Brown, Baba Yaga, Vasilisa. The forest is described this way. And this happens in the forest. And this can be found at the center of the forest. And once you do that, you begin to understand a little better how that natural imagery of the forest contributes to the meaning of the story. So I'll put up links to all these different short stories. And uh, once we finish up with a character analysis of Young Goodman Brown, I might just I might just ask you to do a little comparison forests in the different stories. So mind your P's and Q's, huh? All right. Suppose that's enough time spent in the classroom. Have a good day.